What's up? Okay. Um, I think we're live. Yes, ben? we are live. Um, okay, welcome, cool. everyone. Um, we'll be starting the session shortly. I'm just waiting for a few more attendees to dial in. We'll be with you in a second. Okay, cool. I'm going to try to say hello to everyone as fast as I can. Hello, <laughs> hello, Eda, hello, Arike, hello, Yo. That's a lot of people. <laughs> I can't keep up. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, um, everyone. We're Lesejo and Kay um, from South Africa. And we're going to be your, your guides on this fantasy ride, I suppose. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, All right, there's still people coming in. Very nice. Yeah. Hello to everyone there. But let me start with a with a short introduction while you're getting comfortable in front of Zoom. Oh, still more people coming in. Very nice. All right. Let's kick this off. Hello and welcome to Wacom Comic Week on this lovely Tuesday afternoon or evening or early morning, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you for joining us today on the second day of our online comics and creative event brought to you by Wacom and Clip Studio Paint. And uh, we've got a great session waiting for you today with the exceptionally talented artists from Triggerfish Studio all the way from South Africa. Before we jump into the presentation, let me share some of the very basic housekeeping rules. Nothing to be afraid of, just a couple of very easy to follow tips and tricks to make the session more enjoyable for all of us. So the session is at least scheduled for roughly one hour. Um, we might overshoot a little bit, but that's not really bad. Um, and we have Q&A sessions towards the end, but you can also use chat and the Q&A function um, during the session to raise questions and reach out and we will try to incorporate them in this session. Um, if you really want to make sure that your question is being seen and noticed, do use the Q&A because that's much easier for us to follow up on because the chat tends to be busy and things just disappear on the top end of the chat functionality. Um, Zoom offers you uh, an possibility to change um, the, the views. So play around with gallery and speaker view on the top right of Zoom, because we'll be doing a little bit of, bit of screen sharing. So uh, adjust the uh, size of your video window to uh, optimize the settings for you. Um, important note uh, and a very popular question in all of our sessions before is, yes, we are going to record this and yes, there's going to be a video link um, in a couple of days shared with you um, so you can follow up on this session. Um, all right, on to the next slide. Um, who are we and what are we doing here? So for those of you who don't know Wacom, we've been around for some 40 odd years almost, um, and we're pioneers of digital pen input technology. So every time you're sitting in front of a computer and you realize a mouse or a pen doesn't cut it, we hope and we recommend to check out our devices um, to get you going. Um, and for those who do know us already, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to have you here. You'll be in for a very, very nice session today. Um, the session is also brought to you um, by our partners, Clip Studio Paint. As you might have realized, we've got a growing partnership with them. And Clip Studio is a very versatile graphic software, best suited for drawing and painting and to create a wide range of content with a wealth of unique features. It helps to create anything from illustrations, comics and concept art and animation. So definitely worth checking that out. Um, and with us today is Triggerfish um, Studio, animation film production company from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, 
do check them out. They are producing some amazing stuff and um, yeah, more to that later on. This is the advertisement block and I'm gonna keep it as short as possible. If you're um, interested in upgrading your toolkit, do check out the special offers that we currently run on our e-store with eStore.wacom.com forward slash comic week. And we've got some pretty good offers there for you, starting from a 5% off on the Mobile Studio Pro to a whopping 20% off on the Intus Pro in Intus Pro S pen tablets. If you're based in South Africa, do check out the offers from our partner, Take a Lot, who are also offering a range of really attractive offers for you guys. Okay. A lot of talking already. Now to why we're here and what brings us all together. The speakers of today, K. Carmichael, storyboard artist with about 10 years of experience in South Africa film and animation industry. And she's been talking with Lesejo about storyboarding. Lesejo, South African Goblins graduate, co-founder of the Hidden Hand Studios and runs internship at Excuse my South African dialect, Chimologong Digital Yay. Pressing focuses on authentic African aesthetics. Big word, don't be afraid. It's cool stuff you're in for. So without further ado, let me hand over to our fabulous presenters and enjoy the ride. Ooh, ooh. I guess that's us, Kay. Yeah. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God. I see people saying nice love, thank you. Yes, it was made for me. Uh, <laughs> greetings, who, who, so welcome. I've been, I've been meaning to ask Lola Sefo, who made it? Hermit Hand, Hermit Hand. You can Hermit find them Hand. on Instagram. That's yes. brilliant. Hand of a Hermit. So yeah, welcome guys. This is not the first time me and Kay are working together, especially on something like this. So we are, we are normally over prepared, so we have too much content, but now this is actually the biggest time we've had together. So. We hope to not have to rush anything and we can show you everything that we wanna, that we wanna show. Okay, I go first and then you. Uh, yes, please. I'm, uh, I'm, having, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting hold of some of the Triggerfish content that I want to show you guys. So I would okay. be grateful for a little time to just sort that out quickly. Okay. You go ahead. Um, oh, I must share screens. Share screen one. Hey, everybody. So I'm just sharing the screens quickly. Cool. So welcome to the fundamentals of story. You guys can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen, okay? Yes, we can. Um, yes, I can. can. Okay, cool. So welcome to the fundamentals of storyboarding with K. Carmichael and myself, Lisa Hofaster. That's us there, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so the technique we're gonna use is to grip your attention because we know, we understand and know that we're speaking to people of different levels from like, beginners to some people who might find this uh, workshop as something that confirms what they know, whereas other people find new things. Okay. So I'm gonna start showing you all, showing you guys storyboard. This is a storyboard that I made for the Hidden Eye Studios, my studio for a trailer that we're still working on. So I use Photoshop and TV Paint, and this is an export out of TV Paint, which is why I, I really like storyboarding TV Paint because it shows me cameras. You know, you are the cameraman or camera woman when you're storyboarding. So there's a little sequence that comes here and it looks as such. I'm gonna flip through it quickly just to grab your attention. So these are the roughs. These are all the roughs for a spin, I call it the spinning X. <laughs> I was told to give a, what did, what, what did you tell me, Anu? To, to warn people, PG-13, PG-13. So then we move on to the animatic, look cool. And then this is what the final results look like. If you guys wanna check out the video, you can find it on the Hidden Hand Instagram. It's just that videos with so many of you is not really a cool thing. You can't use them actually, so yeah. Okay, I hope people's attention has been grabbed there because now I'm gonna start. I'm the boring guy. Uh, Kay shows the fun, the fun stuff, how to actually do it. So this is a document that I've been using for I think five years. So it's, it's from DreamWorks. It's about, you know, like 10 basic rules of, of storyboarding. And even when I get stuck, 
I still go back there because they can you can find other notes which are really extensive, but I find that this has the biggest points that I personally find myself struggling with. So the first point is to avoid flat staging unless it's necessary, you know? So this video will be shared with you. You can read it yourself. I don't wanna spend time reading things. So it's pretty straightforward, you know, unless if you are using the Wes Anderson approach to film making, then use it for a reason. And this is so important for me. Lay down grids to help ground your characters and compositions. We received some questions from uh, Wacom before this, and I know that some people want to know how to do things. So I'll show you three quick ways of how I lay down grids in Photoshop. I use the basic hard round. Uh, I can't see my thing. So I use the basic hard round, you know, make grids by holding down shift. That's what happens if you hold down shift and you just move it. So you need to let it go. Okay, so that's step one. The second way is to use the line tool. So if you press and hold in Photoshop, you get a lot of little tools. You can use the line tool. Use it as many times as you want. And then at the end, so I'll keep making the same grid. Can you see that over there? There's a lot of shapes. Select them all, I hit Control E, which is merge and it makes them into one shape, which I then rasterize, and then you've got a grid. So that's two ways to make a grid. The third way, which I think I should spend a little bit more time on is using, rasterize it, is using the filter vanishing point. Uh, I drew one before, because I was testing it, okay. <clears throat> so use the vanishing point you can literally just draw your own you just t -t -t -t, touch it four times and when it's a good perspective it's blue when it's sort of not working it's going to be yellow when it's really not working it's red and it doesn't even show you the grid anymore okay so it's blue and then over here you say on the little top left you say render grids to photoshop and you hit Okay, and then you have your grid in Photoshop as a layer. It comes in as a layer by itself. It's really light, so what I like to do is to go edit and then I stroke. Sorry guys, I'm using two screens. My stroke is over here and I'm saying two points with the color black, okay. Let me see, now you've got a grid. So those are three simple ways to make a grid, which I highly, highly suggest, especially to beginners. So use the foreground, background, background, and far background to sell depth. Can you see how really succinct and on point these things are, these uh, storyboarding rules are? <clears throat> so when dealing with multiple characters, try to logically group them to make cutting back and forth easier. That also means maintaining the same screen position. If you're cutting from a character that's from a close-up, and then the character is actually flying after that, should be in the same screen position so the audience doesn't have to keep searching for them or else they get lost. You don't want to lose people when you're making films. Okay, be wary of your composition in which everything is parallel to the frame. Unless you're doing it for a reason, it ends up very, being really uninterested. But some films have done it quite successfully. And this is a mainly a beginner problem where you try to squeeze a character in just to fit the frame. You know, if you're gonna use Paper, plan properly. If you're gonna use digital stuff, you can resize. There's no need to be squeezing characters to fit within the frame. Okay. So over the shoulder shots, use them quite a lot. And reaction shots, they really help with delivering dialogue. You'll see this a lot with the Pixar, DreamWorks, Triggerfish, all of them, all of them. You'll see that this can convey a message really quickly because you're trying to be as efficient as possible in animation because it's an expensive medium, both time and monetary. So be as efficient as possible, but still as appealing as possible. Okay, and the character squared off and looking at our left or right. Yeah, that means if you're gonna, you see, I'm looking at you now. Isn't that creepy? That's creepy, right? Well, you feel like I'm looking at you. But if I look there, it feels like it's a conversation I'm having with someone, can you see? So that's what they mean. So if you make the character look at the camera, it's really eerie for the, for the audience, but just make them look at the camera's left or right here. Yeah. Little things. 
and explore different character heights. Yes, yes, yes. But this obviously will have to do with if the designs have different heights, but exploit them so you can reestablish your shot in case you want to move away from it. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. And number 10, the most important is motivate your cuts. Don't just cut for the sake of cutting. You know, like there's a noise there. What is that? Oh, it's a bull. Oh, then you'll cut too. Is the bull charging him? You understand? So those are the base, uh, basic 10, and you can find them. Just type Disney Storyboard, uh, DreamWorks Storyboard, and you'll find them. There's nothing hidden from you there. Did you want to say something, Ken? No, no, I just thought that was a really good point about motivating uh, cuts. One thing we see young storyboarders or new filmmakers do a lot is that, that thing of just using using a, a kind of angle just for the sake of it. There's no real story reason why, you know, the camera should be in the corner of the room like a security cam or something. They just saw it used in a police procedural once and they yeah. they want to use <laughs> they just want to use Same that. Thing. But they don't they don't realize yeah, yeah. So but the but the thing is that like storytelling is very simple at the end of the day. People take very simple things away from choices that you make. So if you put something in the corner of a room like a security cam someone's going to assume that it's there is a security cam in the room and that, that there's a big brother element to your story mm -hmm. if there isn't a big brother element to your story then you've just kind of diluted your meaning for the sake of a stylistic choice so that's exactly. uh that, exactly yeah exactly yeah yeah uh, one, one little function. question Formless function Totally. One, one little question here I saw that was interesting. Like what, uh, someone asking about how polished their boards need to be. What's the level of polish you're happy with with your storyboards? Ah, as you guys saw, I was happy with this, but that's because I was animating it. This is enough for me. Do you understand? So you need to think in context. If you design the characters, if you are doing the layout, if you're going to animate it, you can still be rough. But if the animation is being sent to India, and the layout has been done in South Africa. You need to be as descriptive as possible, not painted. You don't need to paint your, your, your environment or your characters, but this is why the, the grid is important. So when you show the grid, at least the layout guys know that, oh, there's a ground there. But it's really, it's, you, you need to know the context of what you're working with. Okay, like the one I'm gonna show you next, it was for a story called Lolo, about a little girl who has identity issues with her hair. And, this one is just a few frames so as to not give the whole thing away because it's still being made. You know, it was pretty clean because it was made in, with that in mind that it has to go beyond the borders of South Africa to go gain interest and the writer Slilo is gonna use it to get funding, to create the actual short. You see, so I'm gonna show you guys different levels of finishes. That was my point, especially for the independent filmmakers because you need to be efficient. Again, it's all about efficiency. And you see, <coughs> excuse me, all of these are things that I got from drawing a lot, just drawing this, drawing that, preparing, doing it on paper first. I love starting on paper, you will see. So there's a little dream sequence. <laughs> and then she comes out looking pretty. Yay. Hello, Daddy. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Yay. He's like, bye bye, sis beauty. <laughs> you see. So, this is a little... Very cute. Thank you. So, yeah, we're going to, to the finishes because that's actually what I wanted to focus on. So, for the Cape Sound International Festival, which was supposed to happen this year, but COVID, uh, this is the storyboard. This was it because my studio was handling it and the people that were working on it were around me so I could tell them what is happening. So, this is just one page of the storyboard because we're still going to use it for next year. And... The animatic look like that. That's my number plate because I didn't know whose number plate to use and get sued. You see? No. That's water, not blood on that on the window. <laughs> <laughs> it's having a giant, giant nosebleed sneeze in the car. <laughs> oh. So, so again, see. these uh, these these kinds of storyboards are are internal for your for your animators and for yourself. Exactly. Um, yeah, for people who who can easily verify what you meant by a shot. Um, and I see that they're still very very detailed because, like, 
I, I this would took me a long time to learn with storyboards. Like the detail isn't so much in the individual drawing as it is in the sequence of drawings. Exactly. So exactly. a sequence with a lot of animation can be considered a very detailed piece because you don't mm. you don't have a storyboard that consists of one image. Like you get that in advertising and exactly that's yeah. uh, that you know that's an illustration. Uh, a storyboard is a is multiple sequences. And I, for example, I had a I had a mentor who. Uh, discouraged me from using arrows, for example, because he would prefer to see animation Absolutely. happening. Like if yeah, if the, if there was if there was a, an indication of like the camera moving from one side to another, he would rather see a beginning, middle, end of that sequence rather than like Arrow. just arrows. <laughs> just arrows with a there. long <laughs> with a long board. Yeah, arrows goes there. Like yeah. yeah, which is a valid way to do it. But it's yeah, I saw his point with the animation. It's yeah, uh, definitely. That's how so you have to think of detail as a storyboarder. I don't know how many like beginners or intermediate people are here, but I'm gonna share with you guys something that really works, worked and works for me. So this is a short by Goblin called Pirates. I, when I was accepted to the school, I started checking out a lot of their stuff, of course. And I started doing something I call reverse storyboarding. So I watch it and then I storyboard it from watching it but using just the beats, okay? Not, it's, I'm not keyframe animated. As you can see, I drew the, the grid there. It's just me trying to understand their way of filmmaking. Oh, I'm on in some view. So, you know, if you guys haven't seen it, check it out. Just write Paris Goblin and you'll find it. So there's a guy who's about to get executed and duh, 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 pirates are here. Ah, charge, says Mr. Pirate. And then they charge the, the town and there's, you know, the pirates are running on the roof, throwing knives, hit the night, the night falls, falls. Uh, Mr. Captain is busy slicing people, slice, 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 pulls this one towards camera and it's a lady headbutting, you know, and then there's, oh, sorry, fight, fight, throw bottle. And this guy is like a Hulk character. As you can see, he grabs this guy and throws him there. You see, use, use of frame. And this is also when I started learning that, oh, TVs used to be square, but now we don't use square anymore. We use the 1690 by 1080. And he's still hulking. Now it's like a little uh, Avengers sequence with all where the camera turns, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I was doing this, I was also learning that, oh, that's one long painting. So I was inadvertently learning about how the layout would look. I didn't think of that. But I was like, oh, that's one long painting. Whereas if I had to just do it without actually practicing it from another scene, I would have failed. I would have failed forward. I would have gotten it right uh, eventually but this is a way to just get rid of that anyway so lady do the flippy 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 it's just it's just a long fight scene here <laughs> i like this film because it feels like the 80s the 80s animated stuff mr hulk punches the camera it's getting to the point guys the point is really amazing <laughs> lady smacks fight fight throw bomb boom and now the smoke and the captain is like go get him so they hit the executioner in the head bloop executioner falls the dude who was going to be executed thinks he's lucky he's like, ah. the captain comes shows him the map with a hole inside and says hey and then he's you see nice framing they're using the actual hole of the map and he looks to the side and the hulk character is there smacks him in the head and the eye patch falls only to reveal that the X marks the spot has been in this dude's eye patch. They put it back on the map and they joyfully walk away, leaving this guy still there at the gallows. And the executioner wakes up, looks at him, pulls the thing, boom, and it's in 2006. Oh my goodness. You see, it was. <laughs> how, long, how long was this? So, this is about as long as an NSE sequence that I've seen yeah, yeah, before. Like, they're they're like about under a minute, seconds. right? Yeah, 30 yeah, seconds, 45 30 seconds. Second. Sure. You see. I really had fun. I learned so much doing this. So reverse storyboarding, guys. Maybe you can ask questions after this during the, the questions. I think I've got maybe 10 more minutes and then I want to hand over to Kay. And not, but wait, there's more. So for those that love anime, I know there's my anime lovers. If you guys remember the first oh, time Eren Yeager transformed, I couldn't get enough of that sequence. So I reverse storyboarded it. For those that know, it's it's the first time where he jumps up in the air, bites himself, and then that's lightning. And oh my god! Cool. So I will not talk you through, but <laughs> if you get the recording, you can watch what's happening. Oh, just go check out the first time. It's in episode eleven of season one. The first time Aaron transformed into a into a titan, 
and while I was doing it, I remember this, while I was doing it, I, wait, space bar back there, yeah. I realized that I was being lost. I didn't know where I was only because I didn't know where the sky was. So I started uh, coloring the sky blue. And then it made sense. I suddenly knew where I was all the time. See, it's not the lesson That's I was looking clever, for. Actually. You see, exactly. And it wasn't the lesson I was yeah. looking for, but it's the one I got. I was like, ah, now I would know how to do that. It's not the lesson we wanted, but it's the lesson yep. we needed. We needed, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I just kept going, kept going till I couldn't go anymore. I think there's like on page six, I was like, okay, okay, I get it now. You, you, okay, okay. And this made me respect the animators a lot more because the thought they put into this like if you if you look at the drawings carefully, they lead with the hip because that three D maneuver stuff is on the hip, so it's it's amazing, it's amazing. And I only realized after boarding it, reboarding it, because I knew something was intriguing. I was like, what is it about? I couldn't stop watching it. So yes, reverse storyboarding, guys, <clears throat> it really really works in your favor. Okay. Yeah, no. So, totally. I think we I think we have a, we have like a five minutes or so. Just like maybe we can address some of the questions that were. Mm -hmm. That was thrown your way. Um, oh, oh, someone wants an ebook of your storyboarding rules, which is very <laughs> sweet. Um, hmm. Let us have a look. Uh, did you uh, learn to draw digitally at first, or um, do you start with sketches? Like, where do you prefer to start? As uh, uh, ah, all in paper. I'm this guy. I'm this guy. I am this guy, but I know the, the I hate saying the new generation it makes me sound so old. I'm only 31 guys, but I know the younger people just goes directly into Wacom. I've also, I know I, I like doing that, but I prefer going on paper because I care less. I know I can literally crumple it up and the option of control Z is not there. And I like that because it actually makes me work faster. So that's personally me. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the, uh, someone asking? What's the difference between an animatic and a? Uh, sorry, guys. If you're asking questions in the chat, by the way, I'm looking at mostly at the question and answer because the chat is crazy. You guys are very chatty, which is very cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, someone asking the question between a storyboard and an animatic. An animatic is a filmed storyboard. It's just the storyboard edited. Um, maybe you can get really as 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 basic or as uh, intense with that as you like. A lot of people like to do some scratch voices with it, maybe even have the actors come in and do kind of a pass over the storyboards. Um, the director will often do his own scratch voices. I, I, I finished yeah. up working, uh, <laughs> working uh, on a film with Triggerfish uh, about a year ago and uh, that will be released eventually, maybe a year or two from now. And um, the, the director there had like a whole little set up right next to um right next to his desk uh with a mic and everything just that he would just quickly it was kind of like a way of writing for him and that's i think the important thing to remember with storyboarding is that it is a form of writing it is not a form of drawing it's um that's really what is exactly. that's that's really what the powerful part of uh, storyboarding is exactly um, <clears throat> yeah so guys, I think to finish off my little segment, I'm gonna show you guys some books that I found really useful. There are two of them are extremely hard to find. This one, Grizz and Norm, 100 Tuesday Chips. It's so hard to find that I've ordered it with a friend of mine who's in America, like I can't find it anymore. But if they still have a lot of stuff online. This, I'm sure you guys have seen these things, Grizz and Norm. So check that out. Yeah. Also framed, framed ink, hard. that's easier to get. Can check out friend ink it's That's a goodie yeah because storyboarding you know you're a writer you are a composer like composition is so important and this will make you focus on that without you even realizing what's happening and the last one is anything by this man by mr hans p bacher his sketchbook composition oh, studies for film. Man. yeah i know man man mm. oh. so you know he does really simple things just lasso and a little bit of a texture here and there and sells the idea so for the people that are interested in getting into this field of work, I offer you this one wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> you must read. As Kay said, you are writing, so you cannot storyboard if you don't like stories. You won't, you won't like it. You won't like the job, you understand? You have to watch closely, guys, because now you're becoming, you're studying film. You're not just watching it for entertainment. And you'll see, it sort of spoils the way you watch films and it also heightens it. 
Okay, so mm -hmm. watch closely. As you can see, I'm stepping on your face so you can watch closely. And draw. There's no other way. And draw. Now. Like says that too. You put those things together and you'll see. And it's also about repetition. Like there's a saying in the in, in, in filmmaking, animated filmmaking, that boarding is reboarding. That's what it is. It's all about reboarding, reboarding until you're never gonna get it right. You're gonna board until someone takes it away from you. Like, ah, it's good enough. We need to move. <laughs> and you have to get used to that. Yes, cool. totally. Indeed. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Cool. I, I can still show you guys more stuff if we have more time, but I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to sort my life out live. Uh, so there's a Q&A and a chat. Okay, cool. Okay. Yes. Um, so hi, guys. I, I'm, I'm Kay, and uh, I have been a storyboarder, um, as you said, for about 10 years now, or there, thereabouts, feels like 10 years. Um, and I started actually working out in animation at first. I studied animation through a film school. Um, it was a very haphazard little course, not anything, not, it, it wasn't really very deep, but we did get to make a lot of films while we were doing it. I made about seven short films while I was studying um, one way or another. And uh, that taught me a lot just about kind of how, it gave me a love of stories and how to put stories together. And I found myself very discontented when I got into actual animation and realized that, oh, this is, it's a highly, it's, a, it's for highly technical people who are extremely patient and really enjoy the details at the end of the process, which was not really where my heart lay. I more wanted to be upfront in the production. I wanted to be making, I wanted to be making creative decisions upfront. I wanted to write, I wanted to do, I wanted to direct. So um, storyboarding and comics kind of suggested themselves to me, one more as a way to make money, the other one as a way to definitely not make money, not as a, a South African creative, <laughs> not as a South African comic artist anyway. Um, so I've done a, a couple of uh, comics called Sophie the Giant Slayer, um, which are up on tapas.io. You, you can have a look at those. And uh, I've, and I've, I've so that, that was kind of like a hobby career while my main career was in storyboarding and in working on a lot of live action film and lately I've, I'm coming back around to animation and I'm now working on on some animated projects with Triggerfish. Um, I have been given some stuff to be able to show you from Triggerfish which would be very nice and uh, I need to share my screen don't I? Uh, do do do. As I'm typing uh, responses as to the answers I have. So it's yeah. to just okay. Yeah, no, go for it. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so here, here are some some images from a beautiful little project that Triggerfish did a while ago. They they did a lot of um, of a. Uh, they did a lot of BBC shorts that you guys may have may or may not have seen uh, for Julia Donaldson's children's books. Um, this one was called Snail and the Whale. And uh, a lot of the concepting um, and uh, a lot of the pre-production was done here in South Africa. And uh, I will try to show you some of the storyboards, but we can't really do video on the Zoom call. So we, we may have yeah. to confine ourselves just to the very, very pretty art. Um, and it's about a little whale who catches a ride with a humpback whale all across the world and just sees these gorgeous vistas um, and uh, is, is sort of with a little snail community here, like confined to the rock. Um, and I, I kind of show you guys this and it's a bit of a, a, a tangential jumping off point to what the, the topic that I really want to touch on here. But I thought this would be really nice to just kind of show you because it's always lovely to look at pretty art. Um, show you a little bit of this production art because what I think uh, is very important to know for you guys going, wanting to go into comic art, if you're interested in comics, you're probably interested in putting together a comic. And if you're interested in putting together a comic, you are interested in the flow of story. You're interested in how story brings across um, character, how it brings across theme, how it, how it speaks to your life, how you might be, but use it to be autobiographical in some way you're looking for a way to express in short your voice so uh like I, I kind of show you some of this concepting stuff to show you where 
as South African artists, we have to kind of, if you're, if you're a, a, if you have a drawing skill, at least here in the South African film industry, you have a relatively rare skill. Um, and it's very useful in terms of wanting to get into concept art and wanting to get into production art and wanting to get into all the various little itsy bits of, um, there's a whole spectrum ranging from like the drawing side of it to the very technical, like putting that together in 3D, making sure little, um, every little detail is kind of right. And these take, this takes a spectrum of personalities and a spectrum of interests. So uh, if you are wanting to get into comics and you're like, oh, comics don't make money or comics don't, I mean, you're European, maybe comics do make money there. Certainly not the case down here, but um, you, you can kind of find, uh, you can find a career in various aspects of this. And I think filmmaking and animation are probably the most closely tied to comics um, and to and to storyboarding, uh, to storyboarding, comics, and and uh, filmmaking and animation are kind of all they share a very large Venn diagram together. Um, but really, what you kind of are wanting to to do ultimately, I think, when you do a when you do a comic, is to express your voice and to bring yourself across as a writer and a director. And you're you're directing a film in your head, or at least I am when I when I do comics. My and my comics have been accused, shall we say, of being very storyboardy and very sort of cinematic. But I don't know if that people really mean that as a compliment or not. That's, that um, can never be a bad thing. Can never be a bad thing. So it's a it's it's one of those it's one of those things where I'm just going to get my thoughts together on this. Um, it's people ask me a lot like what do I do with a comic what how do comics make money how do I how do I kind of what's the, what's the step after com comics because most people don't think anywhere beyond just I want to make a comic mm -hmm. that's cool you've made a comic now what do you do with it do you go the publishing route are you a, a bookseller then because that is what you will be when you when you make a physical book copy of your uh, of your comic um and what I kind of want to, I mean, actually, maybe it's really good that we're, we're looking at a Julia, Julia Donaldson story here, because this is a woman who made beautiful books um, with an illustrator called Axel Scheffler. And, uh, and, and her work has in turn made a whole bunch of other work for a studio and like a hundred odd people down here at the bottom of Africa in a, in a, you know, in a kind of roundabout many years later sort of way. Um, this might be the case with your, shall we call it IP, your intellectual property, which is really what you are kind of making when you make a story. You're making intellectual property. You're making a story that will then go on to, to be shown in many different forms. So what Triggerfish and what a lot of production companies are actually kind of doing now and, and thinking of doing now, not, not specifically, this is not like codified in any any special way, but sort of what we're finding is actually really useful about comics, specifically comic books, specifically graphic novels, is that they are wonderful pitch documents. They are an amazing way for you to bring, to show, A, show people you can write, B, show people you can finish a story, because that is not to be taken for granted at all. Um, when you are when you are trying to get into the creative field, it's like it, I remember this being a, a really something that my teachers and my mentors really hammered when I was sort of getting into when I was younger and wanting to make a story, wanting to do a thing. They would all tell me it's like everyone says that, everybody talks about that. You will meet a lot of people in your life who will talk about getting a story done and will never actually make a story. And one cool thing about storyboarding I found is that it really helps you get over the hump of things yeah. not looking great, yeah. things not looking perfect. And you can kind of see here with the with the bear um, that we're looking at right now, pretty sketchy, pretty like pretty basic. Um, even the color, the the pretty color image of him at the at the corner here, it's like it's just somebody kind of playing with an idea of like how would the color look, how would how would fur come across how do we kind of make him look like he's bulky and furry and so on but while this is very obviously like the the tone of the show is very sort of claymation-y but mm. done in 3d so like well, how does that begin to translate how do we take the real bear across from here with it you can see right uh, very small in the corner there the bear um that's sort of standing on the on the shoreline looking out uh that's the axel scheffler thing it's like how do we take how do we take that character design and begin to pull it over into 3D, into a 3D object that is affected by light and weight and 
is going to interact with the 3D world. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, like uh, I'll, I'll pop over quickly to, oh, where did I put the damn thing now? And also, oh, yes, Jay, when, I remember. When you, you know, when you stop caring about how good the drawing is or how on model it is, <clears throat> you actually, mm -hmm. you release so much, <laughs> you release so much like stress from yourself and you can actually, you grow. The less you care, the more you grow. It's a weird concept, yeah. but that's what happens. Yeah, totally. So uh, here I want to I want to show you a couple of frames from a comic that uh, I I roughed I roughed these two pages of comic for um, a pitch that is a it's hard to explain it's a screenplay that a fr my friend Anthony wrote a while ago and has been trying to get made into a movie for a long time called Sea Monster um, and it's about a girl who befriends the sea monster and he eventually like. He, do, he works in development, which if any of you have any experience with development, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting process. It's an exciting process, but it, in the world of animation, it's, it's kind of like a lot of people just trying to cook a steak by committee. I think that's the way Douglas Adams put it. That's, uh, development is hell sometimes. It is a long, 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 long process of trying to get your movie from a script to showing it to people to getting people interested to people giving input on it to people looking at it to people wanting a pitch document to people wanting a script to people wanting a like some talents attached to it's just it's a whole million billion steps and it all takes months and months it's a long long process so he gets sick of it occasionally and just wants to finish a project so he brought sea monster to us and he found a little bit of budget and he put it together and was like cool let's just do a comic a comic of the movie because it is amazing how much quicker people want to make a thing when they can see the thing mm -hmm. it's one of those really not great or i don't know if it's not great but it's, it's human nature of course like we don't want to put money or lose money on a on an idea we want to mm -hmm. like put money forward onto things that we can actually physically see this is why yeah. book adaptions are a thing this is why um the marvel universe is just being mined like newtonium for for the for all of its content for all of its possible story content so i mean as you can see like this is a kind of an example of what like rough comicking would look for would look like for me um and i think well, let me see if i can find the finished pages uh just over here somewhere so this is what one of the finished pages uh looks like and i think we decided to push the other one uh, th this is like finished by a colorist finished by an inker two separate people um, and then we decided to go for a big splash where it's like, this is where she first kind of sees this, oh, this creature. Um, so yeah, very, very cool, very fun. And I'm very grateful to Anthony for letting me, letting me have this. Um, so this, this could just gives us a really good impression of where, you know, like a, where, where you can potentially take your IP and what you can potentially be using your storyboarding for. And this is the same with short films. I'm, I'm kind of making a, I'm making a film right now where my, I'm using my primary, uh, my, my primary outset as a storyboard artist to make a, a, a storyboard and then add things to the storyboard, but using that as a way of writing, um, because I understand this now about story, uh, about, um, uh, about storyboarding and about making stories and about pitching stories to people that it's, it's much more about like it's much more about giving people a good idea of where you want to go it's it's much more about um helping people to see their way clear to supporting you in your in your dream of going where you where you want to go and sometimes that means giving them a storyboard sometimes that means giving them a book to read giving them a, a, a full story of what of where you want to go to uh, and again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, you know, people might just as easily look at this as they may look at that, but they kind of tell the same story. One's prettier. Um, this might be the pitch document image, for example. Um, but if you wanted someone to read the whole story quickly, you might show them a book full of these sketches because they'll get the idea. They'll get the story from these sketches. Uh, it's not necessarily that much more that much more information to give them a to give them a full finished story of this. So I don't know. Hopefully, I made I've made my my point on all of that. And now I'm going to break down a bit of script for you guys. So I've chosen 
uh, this bit of script. I want, uh, I'll, I'll leave it up here for a second, see if you guys like recognize the piece of script or where, where this is from. Um, you may have seen me frantically putting it together beforehand and so you might, you might have a good, uh, you might have a good guess. Uh, is, are there any story, are there any like questions we can look at in the meantime? There's so many. Um, <laughs> There's so many. Um, I've been trying. I've been trying to type answers to everyone, but I can't. Guys. There's so many. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, just pick one. Go to the Q and A and just pick like a couple. I know. Hey, someone, oh, someone one... said Pulp Fiction. Yeah, there we go. Um, I, I like that story by Robin. Uh, how how do you decide which scene is better for the story? This is really, this is super interesting. Just because it, like this is a man. Like if I if I knew that if I knew the, the answer to that, the, the, on, the honest truth is that when you are doing a storyboard, some, when you're doing a storyboard, when you're doing a comic, sometimes you are just going with the next best idea um, and putting that in. And it's really only ever a placeholder. That's kind of what people mean yeah. when they, when they say phrases, when they say like, you know, crappy phrases like murder your darlings and so on. That's sort of what they're talking about is that everything you do is really just a placeholder for a better idea that comes along mm -hmm. later. And sometimes it comes along after you've finished the movie. And it's, this is, uh, you know, every, every level of director, every level of artist, every level of writer experiences that. And it's not, it's not so bad, but it's, it's, it's very annoying sometimes. Like you just, you literally just have to go with the best idea you have at the time. And you have to go with the resources that you have at the time. So we were saying in our last, um, little jive Lisekho and I that the some of the best uh, shots and the best scenes in cinema were mistakes or mm -hmm. they were last minute rewrites like obviously like cinema isn't really a mistake when you're when you're you know purposefully doing it but sometimes it was supposed to be something else but something happened on the day that just made it impossible uh, there's tons of stories like that in cinema yeah exactly so um, I'm gonna. So we've got a little bit of Pulp Fiction here, and I chose this specifically because I don't really remember how the scene is shot. It's been a long time since I've seen Pulp Fiction. It's been a long time since I've seen most things, but um, it's. Uh, I thought this was this was just good in terms of like it's a little bit of script that we're going to break down super quickly. Uh, how much time do I have? We'll still try to do it in 10, 10 or fifteen minutes. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna have, read it. Uh, 10. We still have 10 minutes at the end for some Q&A. Maybe yeah, the, also, uh, the host can choose a couple of questions because there's a lot here. Yes. So yeah, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, and fly through this really quickly and see if I can storyboard this. And when I say storyboard, I mean, I'm going to storyboard like that, guys. Um, yes. Quick tip on, on drawing. <laughs> I'll do, yeah, quick tip on drawing, on drawing people. Uh, if you want to thumbnail people really quickly, draw them like this. Um, it's called the star man and it's useful for directional things. You can make the star man look wherever you need him to look. And when he's sort of like, if he's trying to touch his toes or something, he has a little bit more definition than if he were just simply a stick man. Not how people touch their toes. They bend their, their head when they touch their toes. Um, and you can also like easily just add little, little like stupid feet and, and hands and things to him. And then suddenly you've got like a volumetric figure that is useful to you in drawing. So uh, here we go. Um, from here on in the scene, everything is frantic like a documentary in an emergency ward with the big difference uh, here being that nobody knows what the F they're doing. Jody, who's she? Lance looking up at Jody, Lance. Uh, get that black box in the bedroom I have with the adrenaline shot. Jody, what's wrong with her? Vincent, she's ODing on us. Jody, well, get her the hell out of here. Lance and, Vis and Vincent in stereo, get the fucking shot. Uh, Jody, don't yell at me. She angrily turns and disappears into the bedroom looking for the shot. We move into the room with the two men. Uh, Vincent to Lance, uh, you two are a match made in heaven. So um i like choosing choosing this i'm gonna i'm gonna like reimagine the scene a little bit just the way i would do it if i were directing this uh the shot there's a couple of little indications in here that we can look for for instance the the camera scene of it's, it's a pretty broad thing over here saying this looks like a documentary in, a, in an emergency ward except that nobody knows what they're doing so we could go, take that quite literally and go and look for reference of emergency wards what what's what it's kind of like there's often like a camera on the bed while they're wheeling it frankly frantically through the halls and stuff like that um 
we could kind of do this, but I know for, I know from the movie that this is um, this is Uma Thurman's character. I forget her name exactly, um, and she she is OD'd, and they're in some drug dealer's house, and so they're not in anything like an emergency ward. They don't have uh, stuff like that. And then the camera movement over here, we move into the room with the two men. So this presumably is like maybe we're standing on the front doorstep. I'll I'll go with that. Um, so there, as far as I can tell as well, I think in the, I think in the actual scene, if I, if I took a, if I look at the, uh, the image that I pulled up of this very briefly, um, with John Travolta's character, who I do remember is named Vincent, I believe this is Lance, uh, drug dealer guy. And, uh, I'm going to say that's Jody. I'm just going to X out her, whoever she is. Um, I just assume she's like, a druggy person who's kind of there in the background <laughs> watching just watching this whole scene <laughs> unfolding um but yeah so vincent's the one who's who's like he's this is his his boss's wife he has to he has to prevent her from ODing or his, his life is probably forfeit uh this is lance who is just kind of clueless and this is uh jody who's a little bit hysterical um so this i'm just i'm just going to give myself that to to work with and say probably lance and uh probably Lance and Vincent have this woman who is just out, really out of it like they they have her at the front doorstep um when this woman opens the door over there uh, I wonder if I can put this on a separate on a separate thing oh it is okay that's fine so I might do I might do something like this where I'm, when I'm just sort of roughing uh, roughing things out and give myself just a little bit of space to play with uh, around a document like I'm not even going as as intently as looking I will do this actually even on a script itself I'll just take a bit a big fat stupid pencil that will or, or pen that will prevent me from getting too bitty and too detailed and I will just go for it um do I have I don't have I don't have any my any of my normal crap here uh I'll just use that as a kind of a as a thing uh, throwing down a little bit of shade here helps you to sort of ground a, a, a character in the foreground. So I'm going to say this is this is Jody, this is Vince, this is Lance, um, and you can color code these characters as you wish, kind of going going through as well. So maybe the men are are, are busy talking, and this whole little bit of dialogue kind of uh, will take place at the door that Jody is guarding like Jody has to be persuaded to let them all in um so maybe maybe we go to Vince afterwards and uh and he says uh no we're going to we're going to Lance he's the first one to to talk isn't he so uh we go to Lance he's talking to her uh he's sort of ho holding this fainting woman uh and talk and uh talking to Jody uh we got to we got to Jody's line over here and uh, she's just like, we'll, we'll just give her like a scene of like what she must be seeing from the door. Um, so she's just seeing these three people uh, here at the door and she's just like, what the hell is going on here? Um, do I have some opacity? Yes, I do. Hallelujah for opacity. Um, so this is- so basic, so Basically this is what just, you're doing now, Kerry, is, uh, is, is beatboarding. You're just getting the major beats. Totally, yeah. So this for me is the fun part, honestly. Um, a lot of people really want to get to the inking part of uh, of their lives. I don't. I, li I live in the thumbnails. Um, Can you and, please speak uh, more about thumbnails? Can you please speak more about thumbnails? I've had to answer a couple of, maybe seven, explain what thumbnails are. Can you speak? Okay. So thumbnails are these. Thumbnails are these crappy little drawings at the beginning, uh, uh, at the beginning of a thing um, where you are literally just writing with uh, drawings. You are literally just writing with shots. You are not to think of them as drawings because the minute you think of them as drawings, you're putting too much effort into them. Um, and plus you're kind of, you're, you're doing this alongside a script. So I'm constantly referring back to what are these characters saying? Um, what is the, what is, what is their, like, like I'm feeling my way through this. It is a little bit looser than a lot of other people do it. Um, some some directors will go out and actually shoot this with a camera. They'll like they'll set up their their assistants or their their ads or maybe even get the the, the characters in the, the the actors in there if they have them available. And they will just like quickly shoot something out with none of the set dressing. They'll just find a door and say, "Cool, now we're rehearsing this." Or they'll like take pictures during rehearsal to do this to get some visuals to see does this work. 
Um, because while the actors are worried about the scene playing out and worried about their, their lines playing out, the director is worried about like, does the visual language support the scene? And is it out of the way enough? Because the great trick with storyboarding is that if somebody notices your, your cool shot, if somebody notices how cool your shot is or how, uh, you know, how, like how good your composition is, you kind of done it wrong. It's, uh, you know, like you, you, it needs to be out of the way and invisible and just supporting the entire scene as you go. So we're on to Vincent's scene uh, really quickly. Well, maybe we'll, we'll do like a twin to, to the scene over here. It's like Lance has got the weird, the weird long hair. Uh, actually, they've all got weird long hair in this, but I'll, I'll just like, I don't know, I'll give this guy a little butt cheek chin, uh, Travolta, uh, Travolta style. Uh, and uh, he's also he's also kind of kind of helping her here. It's like saying she's ODing on us. Um, uh, Joy is Jody is not having the, the reaction uh, that uh, that they're that you kind of expect from somebody who's faced with an emergency situation. She's like, get her the hell out of here. And like from her point of view, she just doesn't want to be involved in any in any drama. She's she's scared of what the consequence of this whole thing might be. Um, so we might even cut back to her. We could cut back to this image of her over here. Um, we could just cut to what was what we call a single on her, where there's no one else in frame, um, and where she's just like again. When 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 you say when actors like look at the camera, they're not really looking at the camera. There's actually a very specific thing that they do with actors where they will put a, a little a bright mm -hmm. little sticker right on the corner of the lens, not the lens itself covering the camera hole, but right on the, on the corner yeah. of the lens. Yeah, right on the ear or something, so that they are looking just off off center of camera when they are looking when they appear to be looking directly at camera. Um, but yeah, she she might like make a she might make kind of a, a hand a hand gesture saying like a, like get, get her out of here and try to even like close the door the door on them and maybe like Vince comes in and like holds and grabs the door, uh, you know, grabs it as she's trying to um, as she's trying to close the door on them and they what um they so they might just like push their way into into the hallway here anyway and this i think doesn't actually maybe work with this uh with the shot as much but like this this might work if they've already like pushed their way in but i'm just going to go with it as they they're like they the big moment where the scene sort of changes from outside to inside is the moment where they decide to give this the single like kind of comedic dual um a line of like get the fucking shot so it's a uh, maybe it, maybe it's kind of it's kind of them breaking into uh that we could even do do a shot just like right behind Jody here, um, where the two men like are yelling at her simultaneously, <laughs> and uh, as they uh, as they push their way into the door. No, and, okay, I I agree with you. This is my favorite part as well. Like I I really like ugly drawings and just going. Eh. I wish I could give them to someone who understands my brain and they do the pretty yes. stuff. This is my favorite part from script to a doodle. Yeah, it's um, Oof. yeah, my whole and it, it you know what helps is actually keeping them keeping the the whole it's a it's a thing where that they talk about in in painting sometimes where you you kind of don't want to go too close like I don't want to work exactly. at this yeah, yeah. at this volume I kind of want to keep it as far away from it as possible because again I'm always keeping one eye on the script so I already screwed that up by not doing that by not looking at the script while I'm uh, while I'm going back and forth. And the, there was already probably a better way to do this line, um, like when they're already in and like they're laying her on the floor and then they both like turn around to her maybe. So I could have already progressed the, the, shot, the, the shot over there, but we don't have time to go back and cry over spilled milk. And um, I'll maybe go back to a single on, on Jody or, or like maybe she's sort of, she's overwhelmed by the situation like physically and, uh, and sort of uh, just emotionally, and she she goes like, "Don't yell at me." <laughs> That's uh, so. This would be her. So this would be her shot here. Um, and like maybe maybe there's a suggestion of a hallway that she's going to run down uh, just now. So like in that in that same shot, she would maybe like 
ran down the hallway looking uh, looking for something while the two men are just in the doorway uh, over here, sort of talking like the, this is, and this is like the A shot of this, this is the B shot of this. You kind of want to show in live action, you you maybe want to show the a, a, a movement in terms of like if a character moves and changes place from one spot in the in the the set to another, or if the camera changes place. That's kind of when you move the camera. Beyond that, you don't really want to go into as much pretty detail as you do with animation. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll just go back to the two to the two the guys here. So where where Vince um, says to you, uh, is saying to uh, Lance, who looks at him, and he's very he's being very sardonic here. So kind of put on his sardonic face, and he goes, uh, "You two are a match made in heaven." And yeah, that's the that'll be kind of the end of this. Uh, that that'll be sort of the sequence. end of my storyboarding the sequence. So that's just really quickly how I break down how I might break down a script. Um, and I might not go go as much as like I, I kind of like added a little bit of extra flair there in terms of you know showing you guys which lines are going where. But I might I, I might specifically do that if I want to remember later on. When I'm, I have the script in front of me and I'm going full digital and I'm and I'm now playing with all of the bells and whistles, um, I might want to remember like, okay, this line is for that, uh, like uh, this line here is for that uh, frame over there, for example. Um, so yeah, but this is really about as like I hope I hope you're beginning to see that when when you are storyboarding, you are you are working your way through something visually you're not you're, you're either trying to write something from scratch which i don't always recommend or you're trying to process a, like a big bit of writing that someone has given you because like if you have to if you're a director and you have to break down a script and you have to break down a story that's a lot of work it's it's a lot to 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 process um to kind of process a story and your main goal with it always is not to be fancy but to be clear. Mm -hmm. So exactly. usually like to this to the, the question earlier of what what's the best um, scene to go with or what's the best choices to go with for a scene, usually the answer is whichever one gets it across clearly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and remembering yes. a lot of the time as well that as a storyboard artist, you are servicing someone else's story. It's not you being the director, you are trying to add to it you're trying to plus what's there you're not trying to hijack someone else's thing and go off um go off and make your own thing yeah but you also get to add your voice you know because you're not just the rest at the end of the day if they yeah. hire you as a storyboarder there's a reason they've seen your stuff they like your sensibilities and your sensibilities you can't get rid of it it's who you are so okay I've, I've seen a, a question like five times it's the same question yep. but it's an odd one People are asking how they can storyboard before they write the script because, you know, they think in images but not in words. What do you have to say about that? Uh, okay, I struggle with this a lot. Um, I like I, I'm making a short film uh, right now, for instance, that I'm mostly storyboarded. Um, didn't really write it actually. I I I like film school honestly ruined me a little bit for writing because I used to write a lot of prose stuff before then and now I'm I'm actually relatively crap at that I I don't uh, I, I don't write nearly as much as I used to or at least I, I I think now visually so this is a very common kind of problem um what to do I I would suggest just then trying to just keep it really easy on yourself. Don't, do not try and make it like you, you will be able to tell from a very early stage with your thumbnails, whether a thing works visually or whether it doesn't, or you'll be able to like, you, like part of doing a storyboard. If for instance, you were making an animated film, uh, you would really quickly be able to tell with a storyboard where the problems in that animation are going to be. Um, I don't know, for instance, like maybe maybe the storyboard is someone running through a forest or something and then you go, I can't draw trees. That's a bit of a problem if you want to set a story in a, in a forest, in for a forest. example. Yes. So, yes, there's it, it's uh, it's little things. It's little things like that. Um, 
I, I would I would go maybe with a with a thumbnailing method like this, except you maybe might not have a script. Mm -hmm. I've often done it with with comics, for example, where maybe I'll just make an example over here, where I might do something like this. This might be my the way I break down a comic, and I'll just give myself a random set of things, and I will kind of begin to write a to write a story like this, and I'll go. Oh, I can actually cut that off over here, um, you know. And then I'm writing the dialogue in as I'm going, but I'm keeping the characters almost literally this uh, this blank. Like loose, maybe they, yeah. yeah, maybe they have a particular kind of a silhouette uh, or something, uh, which is a little easier easier to draw and makes them easy to to distinguish. Um, but yeah, maybe like, and then I might just draw, just feel my again, feel my way through it uh, this way. I I don't I I recommend this way. Um, because it is, it does end up going to some very interesting places, but uh, also you end up doing every single tiny little beat. The animators struggle with this a lot. When you can tell when an animator does a does a graphic novel, because they tend to do every single smallest yeah. beat. Um, they, they animate. They animate still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, and the, the the whole the whole like trick with comics is really that you can make you can say, meanwhile, and suddenly the and suddenly without any explanation, the story is happening two hours later or two years later or in a totally different locale or with totally different characters. Like that's the power of storyboarding is you have words to be able to help you along. So you don't have to make, you don't have to physically see the character go through every single tiny little beat. Um, so yeah, cool. it's- uh, I, hope that, I hope that answers those questions because there were a few of them. Um, and there's a lot of questions about uh, Clip Studio Paint. I don't know how to answer them. I don't use uh, Clip Studio Paint. Is it, uh, how much is it? How much is it? Is it memory heavy? Uh, I don't. I don't find it super super memory heavy. Um, I really only use it for comics, um, and its main its its main feature over something like Photoshop. Of, like of course the the inking is really nice. I I enjoy it very much. But the re the main reason I use it over something like Photoshop is that it allows me to work in story modes. So um, I'm sure you guys you guys are all familiar with this. But if we had to go create something over here. Um, I can actually create, no, that's a zine, that's printing a fanzine, is it? If I, was, if I was going to go and like make a, a storyboard, I could set the, the number of pages over here. I'll just keep all this, all this stuff as is. Um, I'll say a page comic uh, and go okay. Uh, okay. So have to preset where this goes for, for to, uh, I'll just put this on the yes. desktop somewhere. Housekeeping, housekeeping is very important. Damn it. No, I can't like, I can't find the, I can't find a place to put this now. Where can I just put this, please? <laughs> uh, cancel. Okay, just let me do the thing. Oh, in case of cover page, uh, more than factor two, uh, et cetera. Fine, make it a six page comic spread. Okay, I'll just let me have a comic, please. And it'll take a this while guy's... to do. But any, anyway, it, it, it will open up. It will open up several pages. So I'll have I can I can oh. have these pages open while I'm doing this whole deal. This I believe is in like the it's in the slightly fancier version of, of Clip Studio. Uh, oh, sorry, this is Clip Studio Paint EX. So this is not in the more basic version. I don't know what what that is necessarily, but um, this is really useful for uh, for me as a storyboarder because I like to see overviews of things. Yes, I wish yes. I could actually go in. If I had to make one thing, uh, one extra thing here, I wish I could go in here and physically write on these um, on these little thumbnails yes. over here because you can do that with with programs like Storyboard Pro, for example, yeah. which is probably one of the most advanced storyboarding softwares out there you can thumbnail in th mm. in the thumbnail in the views. thumbnail there's also yeah. that uh that capability in tv paint as well that's why i like it so much so you can write over there mm. and make your notes and make little tags you just kind of group so um in the chat thank you pranessa to all panelists attending and um, attendees because a lot of people have been asking me the same question which books there are so if you guys go to the chat you'll see pranessa has answered because i've been answering maybe like 
seven times. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. So one more time. It's Framed Ink. It's 100 Tuesday Tips. And it's Sketchbook Composition Studies for Foam for those people that are watching. Cool. So, so yeah, I think, I, I think, I I've, think gone, I've gone over unforgivably. But um, I think yeah. That's what I was going to say. Um, uh, I think uh, the guys from uh, Welcome will tell us to stop because... You guys were warned. We don't like stopping. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you were warned before time. I know. And I'm not going to stop you for a little while. So keep going if you want to. But uh, cool. yeah, we, are there, we'd, we'd absolutely are, love are to carry any, on. Are there any questions from your side, Welcome, that you are seeing particularly that we must answer? Because now it's on 98. And I don't know which ones to choose. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to stay on top of all those questions coming in. Um, I've seen a couple of questions that repeatedly pop up. Uh, and that is concerning time management. So it, it usually starts like, okay, how much time do you spend on storyboarding, which is probably a little bit too vague. Um, and then it's um, uh, it's going down to how much time usually do you have between brief and until you have to finalize the storyboard, or or maybe as an uh, as an indication, how much time do you spend on a, on a page, for example? Mm. That's really why. Okay. That's a wide yeah, question. It, it, it depends. Yes. It depends on the due date. Most projects have a due date when they come to you. You don't make it up. So it could be in a week. Mm -hmm. It could be in three days. It could be in three months. So you have to. That's what I, I. That's what I train my people as well is to work backwards. Always start with the due date and see what's possible. Then you work backwards because it's easy to overcommit and put ninety-two thousand characters and then you don't finish it. You've got three amazing shots, but they gave you fifteen scenes. Do you understand? So always mm -hmm. working work in context. And drawing like the grid and using the star man can really save your life because you get to understand if the director and you are sharing the same goal for the shot sequence or scenes or not, mm. as opposed to overcommitting. Because a lot of people like to do that. They overcommit and then get sad when they have to change. Because as again, as I said, boarding is reboarding. That's what that's the job. Your job is to get excited to get the changes. If you, if yes. that part doesn't excite you, there's a little there might be a problem. Maybe you're doing too much cleanup before you should. Yeah, totally. Um, I I would uh, I was literally actually doing this yesterday uh, with a with a director for an ad where I had my screen shared much like I do right now, and I was I was thumbnailing as we were going along. So one thing I find that takes that really helps in terms of time saving is. I mean, A, with storyboarding, you get to know how fast you can do things and you also find ways to kind of speed your yourself up a lot. Um, it's a, uh, and there's, there's like possibly little, little tricks and things to that, but it really just comes down to like, you kind of just push beyond needing things to look pretty all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Uh, like the, the the main thing that that really prevents a project from going forward is not having director's approval on something so not having everybody on the same page yeah. um but so so the the soonest you can get someone else to look at your thing and go yes good go for it get go ahead that then the sooner you can get the project done so if you are in a production phase with anybody or working with a writer or um, doing any of that the way that you can like it, it's better to be able to thumbnail things right there with them um, just so that you can double check things with the script and always always ask questions ask the dumbest questions ask yep. really stupid obvious questions <laughs> you'll like, find never... that five of you have that same dumb question it's just yes, the other because... ones think it's too dumb <laughs> yeah yeah no, totally because because you can't really take anything for granted in a, when it comes to a film set or something like I've, I've totally been in, in meetings and stuff where it's like you get to the you get to the end of the thing and then somebody uh somebody says something and then you go oh wait i thought they were all on a beach like i thought this was i thought this was all happening on the beach or something no this you're saying this is happening indoors damn i have to like i have to rethink everything in my in my mind so it's really dumb yeah. little, little things like that like like stuff that like because the the flow of information is so thick and fast and happening on so many levels like visually in writing in uh you know in excel sheets in powerpoint presentations it's just like the information's coming mm. at you from all all sides you need like a storyboard is actually it's it's actually a way that film sets and uh and and production sets you know it's, it's the way that they save money because they save yeah. time 
if you can save like a, a, a storyboard will save everybody the time of going what angle what are they wearing who's in the scene where are we and where are we at like if a imagine if a director had to tell somebody had to tell somebody what a scene every looks like person. and who's yeah had and to tell, tell 300 person. people yeah. Every do you, day. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think that? <laughs> do you think three hundred people working on set is are all going to have the exact same idea of what is going into the scene? No. So that's where storyboarding is invaluable to production sets. Um, know how to portion the panels. Hmm, okay. There's some yeah. cool questions I mean, coming through here. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop. I'm. I'm gonna stop sharing and stop noodling so we can actually. I can actually okay. look at these questions and things. Yeah. Yeah. Please join so, yeah. me. There's so many. Yes, sorry, there's uh, leaving leaving you all all on your lonesome here. Um, yeah, please please feel free to to repeat your questions, guys. Um, yes, please. We yeah we we are kind of like looking at one thing, doing another. Um, I, 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 see a, I see I, I like uh, see yes? I see a lot of uh, there's a couple of questions that have the a similar concept, which is they like reading, they hate writing, they love drawing. <laughs> That's not a blip. A bad place to be it's really not a bad place to be yeah so you know in terms of if you want to start boarding your own story but you don't like writing Kay just showed you how to do that and someone had a really nice idea uh i think it was in the chat i just saw it pop up uh she it sounded like a lady she said she hates writing loves reading what do we think about her storyboard and stuff that she's read from the fiction i say yes yeah. i actually did Whatever. that for a couple of times for some brandon sanderson books but I started Ooh, nice. loving it too much. Yeah, I started loving it too much where my, my work started suffering. So I had to stop because it was too cool. <laughs> yeah. So it was too cool. Fan, fan art is a wonderful way of, of getting yourself, of practicing making stories because it's quite difficult to get over the hump sometimes of, of like you, you kind of feel like you need to come out the gate swinging with like the biggest story and so on. And I see it so many times when people want to start a story. It's often, it's often like, it's often their own post-apocalyptic lives, if I can put it that way. Yeah, That's the yeah. genre that everyone starts in. And there's a reason for that. It's a, it's kind of a, you know, um, people don't often start making stories for happy reasons. So there's a, but, but there's, there's kind of a, people want to make these giant stories and it actually feeds into this one, into this one question over here. Like do, you know, should you start with bigger stories or smaller stories? I personally think that smaller stories can teach you just as much as larger stories mm -hmm. can and they're easier to finish so psychologically they help you get on the horse and stay on the horse which is really when you're looking at longevity in this kind of industry or in this sort of job or hobby or whatever however you choose to pursue it um longevity is really the, the key there it's not so much you know there's you're no good to anybody if you burn yourself out on a on a book after two years and never make anything again where are yeah. you going to be in five years? Where are you going to be in 10 years? Like, you know, do you want to make the, the comic in your 20s? And do you want to be producing the animated show in your 30s or 40s? You know, it, these things take that kind of time. Um, let me see. Oh, is getting into an art school mandatory to be able to get a job in the animation or comic industry? No, I personally don't think so. This, I mean, you, uh -huh. you may, yeah. yeah. Most of my favorite uh, animation artists are self-taught. That's because they didn't have someone to tell them, oh, you can't be an animator and a layout artist. So they didn't know the limitations. <coughs> Excuse me. So their brains just said, oh, I have to be able to do everything. Some of them, you know, it's it's either or. It, it doesn't, it either works for you or it works against you. There's no mid ground. So some people, it works completely against them with a like, I have to know everything where others don't realize that they're actually learning so much. Like LaShawn Thomas is one of my personal favorites and he's self-taught and he realized that, mm -hmm. oh, my character just can't float. I need to draw environments. Mm -hmm. He can go to the environments. Ah, oh, he needs to drive. He started to draw cars. So mm -hmm. no, to answer you, no, we are, some of us are lucky enough to go into good schools, but if not, just YouTube has so much, oh God. Like the stuff that you find on YouTube and in books mm. and on Pinterest and just keep drawing. I'd keep say the practicing. main reason, the main reason to go to school is if you want to travel. <clears throat> Most yeah. countries, uh, I mean, if, uh, like, yeah, if you're, if you're a South African, you need a, a you need a visa to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, if you are European, possibly not then, but also like, if you want to, if you want to, move somewhere like if i wanted to move to canada for example i believe i would need i don't know canada's maybe a bad example but like australia uh, for instance they have a lively animation scene 
um, if I wanted to move to Australia as a, a as an animator, I believe I would need the, a minimum of a BA, a minimum yeah. of a degree to be able to move uh, somewhere. So just in terms of like being able to get into like the logistics of being able to get into another uh, into other countries to be able to do this work, which might not even be a thing now. This is the post COVID world, like you know, yeah, people we're all, we're all don't want to staying at home. Eh. Yeah, it's really like where you can go depends on the strength of your internet connection, which um, we thank the internet gods for our our, our uh, really strong internet connection today because that's not a given here in South Africa. Um, what was the what was the other one? There was some. There's kind of a good one here. Oh, how do you how do you start storyboarding as a as a beginner? Um, some of you saw Lucejo had some uh, some beautiful pencil sketches there where he sort of used that just to rough out. And I uh, an idea and sort of move his way really quickly through uh, through through a lot a rather large project, mm -hmm. um, and it's really like story. You can kind of think of storyboarding as like breaking down a large project into smaller into smaller bits and pieces. If you want to start storyboarding digitally, digitally, sorry, I would hope uh, I would uh, recommend uh, the like whatever whatever kind of Wacom product you can afford. Um, yeah, but I, I, I that, recommend was my a graphic... that was my answer to one of them, like which Wacom tablet to get. I'm like, yes. the one you can get is the best one because they're quite yeah, robust. I, Wacom is the most robust. Very, I found. They're, they're very, very robust. Um, and just like, it's like, uh, it's like driving a Cadillac. It's so good. Um, I, but the, I would recommend getting a graphic tablet. It doesn't have to be a screen tablet. Can easily be uh, one, one of the little, the, the little ones um, that yeah. you sort of lay flat and uh maybe photoshop a subscription of photoshop where um i like i would like to say like clip studio could probably work it has an animation function and you can you can storyboard very effectively with animation functions but uh, i personally use photoshop and look up how to layer comp look up how to use layer comps in photoshop that's how that's how a lot of industry professionals use that um, another wonderful tool is um, Toon Boom Storyboard Pro, which is yeah, it's amazing, fabulous. It's, just it's really expensive. It's really well, expensive, I mean, but that's like four hundred. Well, I mean, in rands, it's like 400, 400, 600 rand a month. Um, which, if you are a professional storyboard artist, that's that you know that's not a bad cost to eat. If you are a beginner and a if you're a beginner and a, a hobbyist, then like yeah, that's you see, maybe a little bit too I'm much. I'm one of those old school guys that want to own the software. You know, I don't uh, wanna, yeah, no. I want to own it, but owning it, that's where the price is like no, what? Because they got me addicted to it at Goblin. Like, we used Storyboard uh, Pro two years in a row, and I was like, mm. oh my god, I'll never ever use anything again. And then I found out the cost. <laughs> that's when because I already had TV Pen. That's when I was like, actually, how can I use this to the best of my advantage? So you see, guys, out of necessity came my preference now i really prefer tv paint in terms of uh, storyboarding animaticing because mm. i start thinking camera from the beginning my camera camera pa, 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 pa. Yeah. um yeah. another another good question here is there a difference between storyboarding for live action or uh, a, a live action or an, an, a live movie sorry li live action and an animation and an animated movie mm -hmm. um yes live action uh, storyboarding as i said you kind of just move the move the you kind of just draw a new image for whenever the camera changes or whenever a character changes position. It's more like where the it's it's called blocking. So in theater, for example, like you take notes when a character, not so much what like what a, what a character is saying in dialogue, but when a when a piece of dialogue moves a character from one end of the stage to another, because suddenly you're changing the composition of the stage. Um, and it's the same with live action storyboarding. You might only change the character dynamic, what not so much on the the the, the you might only change the angle, um, not so much when a character is done saying a line. So someone else was asking, like, you know, do we do we have a new camera angle for every line of dialogue? It's like no. maybe if the if the character is moving a lot, um, you but, know, but try not to. <laughs> try not to, yeah, because yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a. Yeah, like like uh, dialogue is fairly fluid. It, it's it's rewritten at the last minute. They cut out whole whole lines mm. and things. Whereas um, changing angles and changing cameras, you generally don't want to do that on a live action set any more than you can help because 
it takes time to do that. It's not just about like, okay, let's set up all the lights and everything and then move the camera from here, here to here, here and here. Like if you've ever actually been on, the, on a film set, whenever they change the camera ever so slightly, that's two hours of your life, just, re, just redoing the lights and making everything look perfect. It's not like a t television show, for example, where you'll have kind of a stage set up with all the lights and everything going there. And then you have two, you have like three or four cameras that just move quick, slowly, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of like they've moving on programmed. dollies between the, yeah, they've been programmed the characters. Yeah. yeah. And even then in television shows, like, like all, normal sitcom situations and things, they move, the, they move the cameras very slightly. It's a, it's very, very tiny movements. And more often than not, they'll just zoom in or cut in really close. So one camera is focused very close on a character's face. One ca other cameras are, are focused to get in the master shot and get in the big scene. Um, what was the, there was something else here that was pretty good. Oh, how much can I charge for a storyboard? Um, we're not the best ones to be able to tell you because we work in RANDs. Um, and yeah. uh, so a RAND you to a dollar, it's from. about, yeah, it's any given day, a RAND is about 16 to 19 RAND to a dollar. So uh, we, we, like we, uh, we would do the conversion rate for you and you would laugh. Um, I've been told by, uh, us professionals that they charge anywhere between maybe uh 40 to 60 dollars an hour to storyboard um which is not a terrible rate it might even be much more if you're a guild person i don't know mm -hmm. what guild you need to be part of I, it's not not my uh sort of thing if you're if you're a guild member in the united states for example or if maybe europe has various guilds for uh for live action for filmmaking and so on then you might be able to charge guild rates um but yeah also, it's, like, it's, you know uh, people you must you ask really the charge studios whatever that you're interested in you need to yes. ask the studios that you're interested in show them your portfolio you know don't put institutions at such a high level at the end of the day it's people we're all people yeah so if you send an email you'll be shocked that you got a response mm. Mm -hmm. yeah these these places are not are not like you know, they're, they're not sacred places of worship mm. or something that you, you can only approach once a year and with the fatted calf <laughs> and so on. Like you don't, you don't need, you, you don't need an excuse to hit someone up on Twitter and just go like, hi, so where do I, like, where, where can I get in? Where can I, where can I talk about it? And so on. And, you know, and, and Twitter's rather like this, this element here where like, if any one of you were one-on-one -on -one with one of, with, with the two of us, we would give you all the information. We would, we would douse you in information, but we can't because there's like a million of you and the feed is going too fast. So <laughs> it's just purely in terms of like, how fast is the feed? Do people see your, yeah. see your question? It's, it's all that kind of dynamic. You have to think of exactly the social media sphere like that when it comes to getting hold of people it's not like if they don't get back to you it's not because they hate you it's like they don't know anything about you <laughs> um uh, oh, sorry, there is a very good about. question here that says i want to know what to put in your storyboarding portfolios ah, good yes question. I'm, I'm looking well, what I'm happens looking if one... you click answer live answer live answer you live would like to answer there's a button that says answer live. I just clicked it. So Venice, you asked, I want oh. to know what to put in your portfolios. So obviously you're speaking storyboarding, right? So storyboards, you have to put storyboards. I would suggest you put maybe three different genres an action, a drama, a horror. If you haven't yeah. done them, that goes to someone else's that goes to someone else's uh thing about like is it, better, well. is it more helpful to be a gender driven driven storyboard i'm not entirely sure what they mean there but i think but then they name like various like horror romance oh. etc no so just it's be like, able show ability to do different to do genres yeah. yeah and if you haven't done it do it for your portfolio portfolio building is an actual exercise that takes time you don't just put stuff together it's ah there that's what i've done you know it's it's a it's a job to build your portfolio so mm. I'd say put different genres, like especially like very different ones, action, drama, and horror. That's why I named those three. Ooh, and if you like an, story art, do some one. story art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we use a reverse a reverse storyboard for our portfolio? Ooh. That's a dangerous that's, <laughs> that's a, a dangerous, dangerous one. one because that's not, for you. not many that's for you. Yeah, that's that's a no. dangerous one because like not many people have seen the original storyboards of uh, of a movie. Of that show. So not no one would be able to like no one maybe but a, but an industry professional who has looked at a lot of art would be able to look at that and go, 
they might look at that and go, oh shit, these are the Godfather storyboards. And then they would look at, at you and you're like, this person's 22, they're fucking copied. Um, sorry, swearing. But the <laughs> it's, you know, they, they, like they copied or, or something like, and I've, I've literally actually seen that. I think I, yeah. I think we had to look, uh, I think we were looking for storyboarders for this cu current show that we're working on. And we were looking at these people's portfolios and they were then they were like, uh, and the, the director was a little bit disappointed. He's like, oh, he copied on a, on a thing. And it's not like copied, but it's like, it's, it's studies, you know, it's not like, it's not like when you're doing nude life drawing, for example, yeah. like you're copying it's, but it's, everyone understands that that is a, that that is a, an exercise that you're yeah. doing, but maybe, maybe as Lisejo says, maybe it's just for you. It's like maybe that's maybe that's not your centerpiece because mm. i mean if you copy something that's already done like like storyboarding is about generating ideas not copying other people's ideas so if it helps you to learn fabulous but we want to see something where you actually took a piece of script and broke it down yourself so i wouldn't see anything any problem for instance if you um if you took a, a piece of your favorite screenplay, for example, and then reboarded it a little bit like I did over here. Um, and but then be very clear about that up front as well, where yeah. you say where you say, because no, Oh, no, this is an exercise no. I did where I broke down a piece of script from pulp fiction. But no, say that. imagine imagine the reverse storyboard like Attack on Titan. Then you put that in your portfolio and they think you can board like Attack on Titan and they get you the lead storyboard job. Do you understand what trouble you're in? oh yeah that's, so that's a good that's, that's for you. just for you it's just for you to, to practice 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 so you stop being scared of storyboards a lot of people are either scared of them or find them boring but that's because both groups don't understand storyboarding that's the problem it's mm. really not boring and it's it's really not scary yeah somebody asked about like how do you how do you do a graphic novel quickly how do you how do you keep from getting in mired in the details and so on um, I would say kind of choose, do, do my thumbnailing method in a way where it's, it's like, this might be your initial, um, yeah, let me just, let me share screen here real quick to, to give you guys an inkling. Um, da, 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 da. I think okay. the chats have gone off in a very hard way tangent. A lot of Specific people are speaking how? about Wacom. Yeah. Wacom, which one, which one? So maybe... Welcome, you can help us with that because there's a lot of welcome questions happening in the chat, not in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah I, I saw would, the um, thing up. Sorry. Yeah, go, go for it. Um, yes, I mean, as, as you've mentioned already, um, it depends what, what, what you can get your hands on. Um, there's obviously, there's, there's an advantage if you, if you draw directly on screen because it's the closest as you can get to drawing on paper. To paper. Um, but sometimes it's also nice to have like your entire panel in front of you and just draw on a on a on a so-called opaque kind of surface that's flat in front of you. Um, if you have the chance to see us at any of the events when they come back, hopefully soon, um, do a test and try. Go to your retailer, do a test and try, uh, and see what what works for you. Um, Quality-wise, you can't go wrong. They last forever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. just just mm, just try and select what time. what works for you. Very simple um, advice. I don't think I've had. I don't think any Wacom I've ever had. I've had for under. I've had for like under five years. Yeah. It's, they last a while. I've never broken one. I always give them away. I've never broken one. I just like okay. I'm moving up now. Mm. But it's also about a preference thing because uh, in terms of painting, I prefer using the Intuos, which is on the table, and I can watch my screen because my hand is in the way on my Cintiq. And then in terms of animation, I love my Cintiq. It's a 22 HD. Because I'm, you know, I'm animating and I'm in there. So, if you have the privilege to have preference, you can. Yeah, totally. Um, quickly to that to that question about like how do you how do you quickly kind of thumbnail out a a, a thing a, a graphic, graphic novel. novel? How do you finish a graphic um, novel quickly? Yeah, I think the I think what's important is to have is to always have overview. So you start from the general and go to the specific. So, for example. As a, and as I said, like keeping things at a bit of an arm's length and not getting like right up here into the distance, into the details, because I don't, I'm not interested at this stage what this man's eyes look like or, or like, you know, doing detail or anything on this person's face. Um, you kind of want to keep it, you want to keep it far and you even want to like make use of labeling and so on. So, and I, I tend to go 
via the old adage of um, keeping a scene per page. So if this is like the opening scene on the beach, um, if the if we're still on the beach here in the second scene, then it ends. The terminus is, is at the end of this page, um, where you know there's like this is the this is the last uh, like. This, this is the last uh, image of the beach on this page. So we have two scenes here on the beach before we go to like, okay, now we're in a high rise. Now we're in a, someone's, now we're in an office building or something like that. Um, so that it's, it's really just kind of that. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of this. You could go on forever, like uh, doing just multiples of these but keeping it really broad, keeping it uh, f as far away as possible for as long as possible, particularly if you are the type of person who wants to uh, like write with drawings, as I so often do, um, you have to stay in this process until you get to the end and work in passes. Don't try, don't try and like finish this this page, and then go and like and 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 then go and like detail this page. This exactly. page, you, you only get to do page one once you've done the last page. Of Treat your, it like a drawing, uh, you know? Treat yes. it like a drawing. You start with a sketch and then you clean it. Unless you're Kim jong and then you just start and then you end because yeah. you're a master. But treat everything like a drawing. So finish it like that. Um, yeah. Someone treat is asking, whole, what, what do you book. think about Satoshi Kon and Miyazaki storyboards? Marissa Martins, of course, you know what we think. It's oh, what, you what, think. Do you, what do you think? It's <laughs> what you think, <laughs> Marissa. It's rough. <laughs> So stunning. No, what, yeah. what, what we were saying, what we were saying last time when we were talking about this is that like the, yes, the crazy thing for well. me about yeah about about Hayao Miyazaki is that he's art directing while he's camera directing mm. um, and composition with, and light and color because he uses yeah. watercolor on top as well. Yeah, same with with people like Ridley Scott, for example, where like when he does storyboards um, and he doesn't publish them, I don't think like Hayao Miyazaki is stuff is just like you could just collect those things for books and books and books mm -hmm. but um Ridley Scott does something similar and it's 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 kind of like he uses color in the storyboards but he uses it to give sense of like the lighting the atmosphere and kind of a little bit of the production design as well because for him the production design and you see this with a lot of his uh, a lot of his movies like um like Blade Runner and so on uh the production design it's about the shapes that the environments make because for him environments exactly. have a giant uh, effect on the characters um so yeah it's a, like they're they're all just I, I i really admire directors who can uh who can do that but yes when you're doing when you're doing comics this is exactly what is so terrifying about doing comics sometimes is because you are making a billion choices right up front and in, in being able to to make them in an overview being able to like exactly being able to give yourself some breathing room from the story and being able to look at everything holistically first before you go in and start detailing like is that fountain pen he's using pre-1958 or post like you can't make a, a choice like that while also deciding do these two characters end up together or not like like general to specific guys don't don't give yourself too much work to do that actually speaks to the next uh, question that I want to speak to. Maybe can be the last one. Welcome. If mm -hmm. you don't stop us, we won't stop. Okay. We just, we've been warned. Uh, don't stop, won't stop. <laughs> so again, please don't elaborate stop, on stop. the time per board. How do you figure out how much frames are needed for the scene? It's exactly what Kay just said. So can I share screens quickly? I want to show you guys. Um, Where's the norm again? Like that's, that's these guys. Can you guys see my screen? Mm. You okay, can, right? Yeah. So feel free to go closer. <laughs> Yeah, here they're speaking about the difference between beatboards and storyboards. So if you've written your story and you understand exactly what you want to happen, just make a beatboard about it first. So they beatboards are mainly used to pitch the broader beats of a movie, act or sequence. Mm. They are closer in concept to a storybook illustration than an animation. So they're closer. If this is the script and this is the animation where we press play and we're like, oh, it means like we love you. Beatboards are closer to this. they are closer here instead of mm. here. Hope that makes sense, guys. So yeah, think of, general look, to specific, general and look to specific. At the, look at what Laseko just, just showed you over here, because um, it's really important. These three boards, this is how you begin to think when you think like a storyboard artist, when you're thinking in terms of story, because stories work is, as A, B, Cs. 
beginning, middle, end. This, this, uh, this beat board here is beginning, middle, end. Every camera move you do has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every scene you do has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning, the end should look different to the beginning. Um, and that's a really great way to mm. kind of begin to think exactly. about this. Yes, you can get, yeah, yes, you can get really intricate with, with the story. That, like, there's even a, a um, I believe at Disney, there used to be a test for storyboard artists where they would, uh, they would give you, uh, they, they would give you a, a one-line story and see what you could do with that one-line story. And the one-line story was something like you help a little old lady across the across the road. Now you have to come up with an incredible story. You have to you have to come up with I think it's like a hundred boards, a yeah. hundred storyboards for that story to make that story interesting. So it, and it could be anything. It could go anywhere. She gets kidnapped by aliens. You have to go after her. You have to, she, she turns into the beautiful princess of Mars. You marry her, you come back and then you cross the road. That, you know, all of these sort of, <laughs> it, it could go anywhere. It could do anything. So you, you, you showed what kind of a storyboarder you were, what kind of a storyteller you are, because that's really what they're testing. They're testing like, do you have ideas? Do you have stories? Do you, are you spilling over with, um, with dramatic storytelling, like, or do you have a, a great touch when it comes to drama? When it comes, like, can you tell a, a story that's so sweet that it makes people who watch it cry? Like, they will, they will hire you in a second if you can make them cry at Disney for whatever reason. Even if you can't um, draw really well, if you can yeah. emote and yes. have sequential art. Okay, yes, that's, I think I think that works. Down, 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 down. Okay. Um, oh, one last to... question. Okay. Yeah, let's make it a good one. I, 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 mm, you choose. Mm, mm. Dealer's choice. Hmm. Oh Lord. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I want to choose a good, good one now, though. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um. Oh gosh. Uh, yes, it's ending, Sarah Sanchez. Sorry to have to leave. Yes, K, sorry. Kay has, a, Kay has a British to... accent. <laughs> what? K has a British accent. That's what I read. Oh, do I? Lots of people told. <laughs> lots of people here think I'm from the United States. So, yeah. it's um, yeah. You're welcome, Kilbore, Kibore. Thank you, guys. Uh, hmm. Thank you. Dash dash. Well, okay. Well, there, here's um. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's here's one. Um, if you're a one-man army in a sh uh, like in a short that will improve your chances of the industry with that one short, I'm assuming it's kind of like how do you how do you get depends. something made if it's just you? It depends. It depends. Do you you have your time management is everything like you know someone like Rocket Boy or Tony Pantoa, They do that. They are one-man tanks. But some people have actually gotten sick and had to stop animation because their backs gave out or they risk like yes. gave out, gave out, you know. So know who you are, know your limitations. You probably have friends. So rather start with asking a friend or someone who you're studying with or someone who's like minded to help you before you mm. just want to do it alone because you want to do it alone. But it is possible. Yeah. There's people that we both know that do it all the time. They, they've come to a point where they prefer doing it alone. Yeah. And in that, it's also like I've, I've, uh, I'm sure you guys, you've all experienced this to some degree. Like when you start telling people that you're interested in comics or animation or something, you get suddenly a lot of random people coming up to you and saying, like, I have an idea for a comic, I have an idea for an animation or something, and they kind of want you, they want to make friends with you so that you will do it for them, so that you'll make it for them. Um, and that's not how you ask someone to help you out. So even if you do have a friend and you, who's willing to help you, it's it's better if there's some if there's buy-in from them, and you're kind of approaching them as like, hey, you color better than I do. Like, will you take care of the coloring on the on this comic, and I'll take care of the inking, or I'll take care of the writing. Like, I just need somebody to color, and then you work out some form of compensation. Doesn't always have to be money. It yeah, could be that you can you, help them. Help yeah, it could be project. that. Yeah, it could be that you both get your projects done together, and there, and you're paying, you're repaying the favor for them down the line, or I don't know, you're just you're letting them cash, cash. Maybe they're they're like, 
maybe they need a place to stay or like they they need a holiday house for the for for the end of the year or whatever it is like you work out something um but giving give them something with definite parameters to help them kind of get through something that like people can get their, their heads around because when it when it's very open-ended and there's no boundaries to a contract or to a a favor then yeah. it becomes really messy and it becomes very awkward to be able to ask people to kind of help out with it but i, I agree with uh, Lesejo, like ask people for help because i'm finding this myself like i'm very much a i want to do it big from beginning to end by myself and the real truth is that when you are in a production it's uh, a story is better than it could have been with just you mm -hmm. A story is a lot better when it's with when you're working with a team of people. But then you have to codify that. You have to you have to work that out properly. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, that's yeah. all that's that's all from us. If you guys um, <laughs> if you guys want us to continue, we will. But yeah. <laughs> wow, um, I'm 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 stunned, and I think all, <laughs> all of the others that have been following you. Uh, Yeah, are as impressed as, as we are here. Um, there's still so many people in the in in the forum, and there's so many questions in the Q and A's and in the chat. It's just amazing. You guys have been an amazing audience, and UK and yes. Lesejo have been great, great, oh. great, great presenters. It's been a joy listening to you. So, a wealth of information and inspiration. Um, highly appreciated. And as you both have mentioned. Um, There's a lot of work that goes into creative projects and it's always a team effort. So thank you very much for being part of the team here at Comic Week. Um, it was was really, really cool and enjoyable. Um, it was so, a spectacular experience. Thank you so much yeah, for you giving us for the opportunity. Us. And thank you for everyone who, who, came to, who came to watch. You guys have been all so lovely. Thank you guys. Hopefully we get to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. So let me wrap this up with just one, actually, sorry, I'm lying, two slides, because there's still so much, um, so many open questions. Um, do check us out on social media, be it Wacom, at Wacom on all the channels or Clip Studio Official or our presenters, k.carmichael, k underscore carmichael on Instagram and Twitter or Lesejo Forster on Instagram check out their profiles, check out their, um, their artwork for inspiration. It's, there's a lot to see and it's a good way to connect with other people. Um, I don't promise you will see any artwork on my Instagram. You'll see mostly knitting projects. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also good. I mean, we, we've been talking about inspiration. You, you need to yeah. open up your, your mind and, and find inspiration wherever it comes from. So totally. yeah. Break the routine. Exactly. Um, And again, if, you, if you're considering um, upgrading your gear, do check out the e-store with forward slash Wacom minus week, uh, uh, forward slash comic minus week, or have a look at Take A Lot. Um, also, quick reminder from the guys from Clip Studio, because it also popped up in the questions. Um, keep an eye on the follow-up email after this session, because everybody who's filling in the survey that they share with that email is uh, making chance to winning a uh, full version of Clip Studio Paint Pro. So might be worth checking out. Um, that is it for this session. Thanks again to everybody. Um, if you're curious about more sessions during Comic Week, um, there's another nice talk coming up at 5 p.m. in hey, an hour with uh, Maya and Yehuda Devia. Oh. You might have seen them come across mm -hmm. on various social media platforms. Um, and it's going to be a nice session. Oh, too. they're so cute. Yeah, I love yeah. these guys. <laughs> Good luck to both of them. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you again, Kay and Lesejo. It's been a blast you. and um, chat soon. Thank Cheers, you. Guys. Bye bye, everybody. Fabulous. Yes, everyone. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Cheers.